Hey, welcome back everyone. As we've been going through this schematic element series, some of our projects have gotten more and more complex, but today I wanted to actually take a step back and actually start breaking down something a little simpler that I guess I have taken for granted in some of the uh, other series, and that has to do with impedance, passive filters, and passive tone controls. And so um, when we talk about impedance, we are talking about something that literally impedes the transfer of electrical energy. And the three passive impedance elements that we have are resistors, capacitors, and inductors. And so if we start off looking at resistors, a resistor has the impedance, has an impedance value that is just the value in ohms. And that is completely frequency independent, meaning that resistance applies the same over all frequencies. And so if we arrange two resistors in a configuration like this, the calculation for this voltage divider is that it's actually going to be um, R2 over R1 plus R2. And I actually have my labels mismatched here because of how I place this. So this is actually <laughs> correct. So it's R2 over R1 plus R2. And there's a whole series of derivations that can be done to show why this is the case. But that's beyond the scope of this series. And so I'm just presenting this as kind of the introduction to what happens when we start working with frequency dependent impedance, because that is the basis of filters. Because a filter quite literally filters out some kind of frequency content. Now a voltage divider is not going to filter out any frequency content, it's simply going to scale it down. However, if we look at the impedance of a capacitor, the impedance is one over J omega C. And um, omega is two times pi times F, which I guess I forgot to put the F in here. Let me do that real quick. And so what this means is that as frequency changes, the amount of impedance that is seen by that is seen through the capacitor changes. So if we look, it's a 1 over F relationship, which means that if F is very, very small, our impedance gets very large. In fact, if F goes to 0 or DC, Z becomes infinitely large, which is why we use capacitors. They completely block DC voltage. But we also use them because as we go higher in frequency, the impedance drops off, which means it'll let more high frequencies through and less of the low frequencies. And that is also determined by how much capacitance there is in our capacitor. So if we take our equation for our voltage divider, but we now make it so that one of our elements is a capacitor instead of a resistor, our voltage out is going to be Z2, so the impedance of this element, over the sum of the two impedances. So if we uh, substitute in our equation for the capacitor, we can see that our uh, actual impedance is this, okay? Now, this equation may look kind of scary, but what we can do is just realize that in this configuration, this is going to be a low pass filter because what's going to happen is that as a signal comes through our resistor, it then sees this capacitor going to ground. So the really high frequencies are going to go to ground very easily, which means the output is not going to have those high frequencies. But the low frequencies are going to see a high impedance presented by this capacitor, which means that we're going to have more low frequency content that stays on our output node here. And 
to find the cutoff frequency of this filter, there is this nice little equation here that is 1 over 2 pi rc. What that means is if you make r or c larger, the cutoff frequency of the resulting filter moves down. So if we have a low pass filter that looks like this, and we make either the resistor or the capacitor larger, we now have a new filter that does that. We've moved the cutoff frequency lower, okay? And so this is what is called a single pole filter or a first order filter. It is the simplest kind of filter that we can create and um, it has the characteristics of rolling off content at 6 dB per octave. Now there are lots of places you can go and read up on all of the deep technical stuff about this. But the thing that I really want to drive home here is that the arrangement of a resistor and a capacitor like this being a low pass filter is something that you should be able to look at and instantly see in a schematic and go, oh, that's a filter. Now, if we flip flop the capacitor and the resistor, we actually get a high pass filter because now what's going on is that our signal as it comes in sees a large impedance at low frequencies here, meaning that the low frequencies aren't going to make it through this capacitor very well, but the high frequencies will, which means that the filter response is going to look more like that because it's blocking the low frequencies but letting the high frequencies pass. And the calculation for the cutoff frequency is the same, though I do see an error here. That is not actually omega. This shouldn't be omega, this should be f because we have the 2 pi in here already. The 2 pi converts omega to f, okay? Um, that is a convention that is used in electrical engineering. So now the practical applications of these are found in just about every circuit out there. You can pick pretty much any circuit you want to and you will find some form of either a voltage divider or a low pass or a high pass filter. But if we were to make it so that one of these elements can be varied, that means we can actually change the frequency at which it's cutting off. And that is the basis for um, our passive tone controls. So I've got three basic tone controls here that um, are found in a lot of guitar pedals. The first one is just a variable low pass filter where we have a small fixed resistance and then a variable series resistance here and the capacitor to ground. This is the tone control that's used in things like the RAT. This is also what a, uh, an onboard tone control for a guitar is. is just a really basic single pole low pass filter. Okay. Um, another really popular um, tone control is the Big Muff Pi tone control, which if we look at this, it's actually a there is a low pass filter here, there is a high pass filter here, and the output is just mixing between the high pass and low pass filters so that you can dial it all the way to a high pass filter where it's getting rid of the low frequencies or all the way to the low pass filter where it's getting rid of the high frequencies or anywhere in between. Okay, and so looking at this arrangement and just breaking it down into the little pieces makes it so that we can understand it a lot better. And um, there are other articles that'll go more in depth into exactly what the response here looks like. But the idea is to be able to see things like this and recognize what it is we're looking at so that if, for example, I wanted to change this tone control and I wanted more brightness, for example, then I would make it so that my high pass filter perhaps has a higher cutoff frequency, meaning I'm getting rid of more of the lows. Because one thing about passive filters is that they can only ever cut. You can never add content 
with a passive filter. You can only ever take it away. And so this tone control is just blending together, taking away some high frequencies and taking away some low frequencies. Okay. Um, and then if we were to actually take the rat tone control and do a little modification to it, we would get what is called in the DIY world, the stupidly wonderful tone control from Mark Hammer. And this is the same idea as the rat tone control in that you have a variable resistance that goes through the capacitor to ground, but the, the advantage here is that the output is always seeing the same series resistance through R10 and this pot. Now, the great thing about that is that um, particularly if this is a passive tone control, the output is always seeing the same uh, is always seeing the same resistance. Whereas in the rat tone control, the output is seeing a different series resistance, which means that whatever's happening here is going to interact dynamically with whatever's on the output here. Okay, and that is not always something that we want to see because that means you can get unpredictable effects. On the stupidly wonderful tone control, what you have on the input is always going through the same amount of resistance to the output, which means that you're going to have a consistent behavior in the interaction there. Now, I mentioned before that we have three kinds of passive components, and those are the resistor, the capacitor, and the inductor. And so the inductor has its own behavior associated with it, where its impedance is J omega L, or 2 pi F L, meaning that the impedance is very small at low frequencies. In fact, it won't block DC at all because at DC, omega goes to zero and impedance goes to zero. But as we go up in frequency, the impedance of the inductor goes up. And so if we pair that with our resistor and our capacitor, we can begin to create what are called resonant circuits. And really what I mean by resonant is that you can have the inductor and the capacitor interacting in such a way that there will be a specific frequency where impedance is at a minimum. And that is at the resonance point, which means we can create resonant filters like a bandpass filter. Okay, so a bandpass filter will have a response that looks something kind of like this. Okay, where we have a band of frequencies that it's going to pass and it's going to reject everything that's on the outsides, okay? And so bandpass filters um, get used a lot in, um, particularly with active EQs, you use bandpass filters to um, make things like a graphic EQ or if you have, you know, different bands of EQ, like a low, mid, high that you can turn up and down, you use bandpass filters to create that. And that's because the inductor and the capacitor are working in such a way that there is at this center frequency, there is a minimum in the impedance going along this path. Okay. But now if we flip the orientation of the resistor and the series uh, capacitor and inductor, we get a band stop filter where because the, there is the resonant frequency of the capacitor and the inductor, it creates a low impedance path to ground at that frequency, which means that a lot of the circuit gets shunted to ground instead of going out the output. And that results in a response that looks something sort of like that, even though that's really ugly. Okay, so that's a band stop filter. 
And the same equation for both of these is used to find where that center frequency is. Okay, I again left my F out of the equation here, but it belongs in there. Okay, and so while we don't really see these um, band pass and band stop filters as passive EQs very much, it's important to understand that there is a way to passively pass a certain band or notch out a certain band using these components. And these will actually come into play much more as we start talking about some of the, um, some of the adjustable active EQs, parametric EQs, graphic EQs, those kinds of things. Um, but uh, there we have it. That is a really quick look at the basic um, passive filters and how they tend to get used in guitar circuits. And this is just the first in a multi-part um, series looking at these different filters and um, EQ and tone controls and everything. And so stay tuned for the next one where we are going to talk about taking some of these arrangements but then turning them into active EQs where we can actually boost certain frequencies as well as cut others. Until then, take care.